Hello and welcome to Streamers and Punches, the podcast from Sound Notion TV that looks at current events and new releases in the world of film music. My name is Bill Witham. And I'm Kevin Wilt. And on today's episode, we'll look at a couple current events in the news. We'll look at a few releases. We'll talk about what Kevin and I have been watching and or listening to lately. And also, Kevin had a very cool trip to Southern California recently. And I'll grill him on what he did there and who he met and how that makes me jealous. Okay. But anyway... Uh, all right. So John Powell, whose score is coming up soon to How to Train Your Dragon 2, uh, has made a minor announcement. Kevin, you want to take that one? Yeah, uh, it looks like, and I guess this isn't the first time he's done this, but he's taking a, a bit of a, a hiatus from film music for a bit uh, to focus on some concert music projects and, and things like that, um, which I, I, you know, I think is kind of cool. Um, yeah. There have been other composers certainly who have done that in the past. I know um, both Don Davis and Elliot Goldenthal had done that within the last couple of years, both of which I think they both did it to work on operas. I don't know exactly what John Powell will, will be working on, but um, so there you go. So uh, How to Train Your Dragon 2 it seems maybe the last film score we get from him for a while, but I'm sure we'll get some cool concert music. So we have that to look forward to. Cool. And um, so you found a – speaking of How to Train Your Dragon 2, you found a review of it online. Yeah. There is a, a review on filmmusicmedia.com, and we've got the link for that. We'll have it up on our website, soundnotion.tv slash SAP, where you can check it out. Uh, it's, pretty, it's pretty favorable. Um, you know, as you might imagine, he brings back a lot of the original themes from the first movie, does some other cool stuff. Uh, the reviewer kind of mentions how – John Powell is arguably right now the the king of scoring animated films. Mm -hmm. um, some scores being more successful than others, but the reviewer puts this one in the successful category. So it's it's worth a read and, and sounds like it's a score that's worth listening to. I'm 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 excited to check out the movie myself. Yeah. Uh, and we've also got a review. This was a, a concert we talked about a couple of months ago. Um this is a review from the Hollywood Reporter. This was a concert um that was uh, took place, I think, actually just a couple of weeks ago. It was a concert of a bunch of different film, or uh, excuse me, television music from a bunch of different TV composers um, putting this concert together and really kind of the first of its kind. Uh, this was at UCLA, but it involved a bunch of different uh, composers working in TV, um, one of whom was um, Jeff Beal, who Friend we had met long ago conducting some music from House of Cards. Um, Alf Clausen from The Simpsons uh, conducted some music as well. Okay. And, um, there was some music from uh, Family Guy. There was some music from Downton Abbey. So kind of this big concert uh, of live TV music, which was kind of cool. Barry McCreary was there, uh, as you might imagine, since he scores like half of television these days. Um, so yeah. again, a cool review of the first kind of TV concert um, worth checking out. We'll have the link for that on our website as well. Okay, cool. Uh, so let's see. Uh, John Williams, he's got a new piece. He's got a new piece premiering tonight. Yeah, there's there's this new ensemble called the National Brass Ensemble, which when you read the roster of this group, it's fairly insane. Now, Bill, you're a brass player. You actually probably know a lot of these names better than I do. But most of the people in this ensemble are – some of the biggest names in brass from the largest, most prominent orchestras in the U S um, they're doing a concert. The concert is actually tonight in Northern California at Sonoma state university. They're doing a huge program of um, Gabrielli, but then they also have this world premiere of a new uh, John Williams piece that um, it's not announced in the program or anything, but the Joanne Kane music service who we'll talk about a bit today. Um, a couple weeks ago posted a photo of actually a, a photo of the music that they had prepared for this concert. And the title on that just says it's called Music for Brass. So that's what we have to assume the title is. So that concert is going on tonight. So if you're in Northern California, go see it. I'm not, so I can't. <laughs> yeah, I'm looking at the roster right now. Uh, Joseph Alessi or Joe Alessi has been principal trombone in the New York Philharmonic for about the last 30 years. Fantastic trombone player. Yep. Really, really great. Just a, an amazing sound on that cool. instrument. Yep. Uh, and then there's Chris a Martin, principal trumpet from Chicago Symphony. 
Oh yeah, yeah, He's and I've good, you know? and I've seen him play some of the John Williams trumpet solos like JFK and uh he recorded the trumpet solos in lincoln in lincoln yeah. right yeah right so he's oh he and, and you and i saw him do quiet city i believe yeah a couple Which years ago. knocked out of the park absolutely yeah yeah but um, you just you just look at the the kind of credits associated with these people so yeah joe alessi principal trombone new york phil principal trumpet from uh, philadelphia uh principal percussionist and principal timpanist from the cleveland orchestra Principal trombone from the L.A. Phil, bass trombone from Detroit Symphony. It's just that that's what the entire list looks like. It's very impressive. So I'm sure it will be a great, a great concert this evening. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Uh, let's see. What else? Anything else going on? We got yeah, uh, there's, David Arnold. There's another concert coming up next month um, in London, July 9th, actually. David Arnold is doing a concert called David, David Arnold, A Life in Song, which is going to be performances of a bunch of um, – his film music, I also think some of the music he wrote for the London Olympics. But um, there's going to be music from Independence Day, uh, Stargate, which are probably, aside from some of the James Bond movies, maybe his two most famous scores. Yeah. Uh, and then also some of the music he wrote with Michael Price for Sherlock. So that sounds like it could be a cool concert, too. Again, I will also not be in London on that day. So so I do I do have a very existential question in case we ever do get David Arnold on the show. Okay. But that would basically be, why did you change huge directions in your career after uh, sort of getting the reputation as the next John Williams or the next composer for really large movies, which may be the answer to that question. But, but soon yeah. he started scoring like small movies with maybe there were more dramas, but they'd still be A-list with like stars like Ben Affleck, Samuel L. Jackson, things like that. And he'd score very sort of electronic oriented scores and just kind of smaller in general. And, uh, and then he sort of is now doing Sherlock and I'm trying to think what else in recent years that I'm totally missing. Uh, no, I can't think of anything else. And anyway. Yeah, it's so, been a couple of years since mm-hmm. he's done a James Bond flick because Thomas Newton did the last one, of course. Oh, yeah, of course, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I think that's a good question. And like you said, I think maybe you've answered it too. I don't know. Yeah, that could be. He would be an interesting guy to talk to, I'm sure. All right, so um, let's see. I've had a chance since our last episode to catch a couple movies. I just wanted to share that. So um, right after we talked to John Altman, then I, I think it was that night or the very next day that I went out to see X-Men Days of Future Past. Yeah. And it, I mean, it was awesome. I mean, the movie was a lot of fun and it was, you know, high stakes, so high drama. So the movie's very um, um, sort of just, it just pulls you right in. It's very dramatic as as well as, you know, sort of servicing all the, the tropes of comic book movies and things like that. It's got something for the fans and I think even like general public watching it would, would really get into it. And then it was kind of fun to, to hear the music. Like he said, they were afraid that they'd need to update it somehow, but, mm-hmm. but his theme kind of made it back. So in a way, it was like this movie set everything back right with the X-Men movies, which... You, if, both, both in terms of like universe <laughs> and in terms of music, you mean? Well, it's funny because by the time the movie's over, it's like they kind of washed away memories of that bad X-Men movie. Yeah. And <laughs> for both... This is what was so great. Okay, so maybe minor spoilers, but... The movie's been out for like a month. Go ahead. It, yeah, but maybe it, it washed away for the characters, too, that they could start anew, and all sorts of crimes against these characters committed in earlier movies was completely, like, undone, or what the interwebs would now call retconned, I believe. Mm-hmm. And so <laughs> that was all, like, just restarted. And then the and then for the audience and the movie franchise also I thought was a really fascinating parallel and part of it was John Altman's music coming back in it did it sat it just it sat well it, it sat right and it felt correct at the beginning of course I do love part of um, uh, John Powell's score parts of John Powell's score and and some of his cues for um, the X X Men what was it. X Men Three, The Last, the Last Stand. Stand, right? Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. I enjoyed the, the, sort of the different, sort of the, the slightly different approach thematically, but although it was still sort of ramped up, minor key, lots of brass, it had a very similar um, sort of texture to it. But anyway, so that was cool, and it was really awesome having just gotten to talk to him the very next day. There's his name on the screen as editor and composer, 
and then we we hear the work and and it was tightly edited too. I thought the editing job was fantastic. The movie just really moved at a good clip, mm -hmm. and it kept me pulled in and caring about what was going to happen to the characters all the way through. Um, I also had a chance to catch uh, Edge of Tomorrow, the new Tom Cruise sci-fi movie, which just came out last weekend with a score by Christoph Beck. Uh, now here, this is the sort of, you know, the underhanded comment to film composers. But I didn't notice the music throughout. I actually let the movie just kind of grab me. And that, did a, that movie did a very good job. I was really concerned all the way throughout for what was going to happen to the characters. It's very simple. There's only two characters to really follow in that film. And it did an excellent job in the music, the editing, the, the acting and the writing and everything else worked really well together to kind of keep the movie on a really good forward momentum. And it didn't miss an opportunity to have like sense of humor and then also like high stakes. So it had a lot of similarities in some ways to the X-Men film. But Christoph Beck's score was, I think it was, it was there everywhere it needed to be and just kind of, you know, provided the right punch. Mm -hmm. But you know, like most movies today, it did not stand out as having like one big theme. I, I didn't feel that I was getting um, kind of served up something musical that I needed to like remember and take away. So in that respect, it sort of just followed the today's modern mm -hmm. approach to action scoring. I, I think I think I generally have that reaction to his scores. I mean, he he scores a lot. He writes a lot of music for a lot of films, particularly he does a lot of comedies and stuff like that too. Um, mm -hmm. But that, I feel like that's kind of always been my reaction to his scores is they're there and they serve the film, but they don't really stand out. And I, yeah, I guess I almost think of that as kind of a, a specialty of his. Um, but like you said, not in a bad way. I mean, yeah, it's it's the films seem like they're always served by um, the music. But most of the, it seems to me most of the scores that he's writing or at least most of the films he's writing for, uh, again, particularly, I think some of the the kind of slapstick comedy stuff, um, the score really isn't, isn't the point. Um, and so in that sense, because it doesn't stand out, it's kind of doing what it's supposed to do. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's see what else. Uh, oh, and then since we've been talking about, uh, on television with, uh, the clone wars and, uh, Kevin Kiner's, um, approach to it by borrowing some of the John Williams's themes and slightly re redoing them. I've just been, Continuing to watch it and enjoy it. And, of course, I'm marveling at how many, like, it's just the content, like, how much visual attention they pay in the show and how well rendered it is and, and all these extra planets and universes and looks and designs. It's just, it's kind of floored me. Uh, and then the music, it's just a lot of music. It's all, it's wall to wall, yeah. just in the background. And, and I can't tell, in some cases, I, I thought I could tell that some of it was, you know, sampled. But, you know, I've seen videos with him speaking and he's showing demonstrations of the music in uh, software. And, and I heard him play some of it and it sounded, you know, like samples. And then when I hear in the show, <clears throat> there'll be a trumpet solo or something that sounds pretty good. Like it could be real. I, 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 I think from that show, it seems to me like it's probably a combination of stuff. Yeah, okay. uh, certainly the, 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 the opening and closing titles, I think, are, are live but yeah, every once in a while, some of the cues in there sound like they're they're sampled. So, which I think is that's probably going to be a pretty standard thing for television. Yeah, yeah. Now I didn't realize because, uh, as our producer said said earlier, um, Netflix tells me what else I should watch, and I listen to it. <laughs> so, uh, in in the, the Netflix my list section, it said, "Oh, you've been watching Clone Wars, so we recommend Clone Wars." And I thought, "Wait, what is that? Why has that got like a different image on it?" And I totally forgot that there was like an hour and a half episode that was – that is basically the first episode of Clone Wars. And it was released theatrically and made a bunch of money. And then it, the show actually went into proper show formula schedule on Cartoon Network. But I didn't watch that. I just jumped right into the episodes. So I thought it, well, the, the show was cool because it didn't have all these stupid moments where they introduce all these characters. They just jump right into you know whatever the, the plot is. And then I watched it, and then, and that hour and a half episode had the the opening and closing music was identical to the way it runs in the show. And my first thought was, well, they probably uh, they probably directed the budget at that first episode to be top of the line, so you do get orchestra, you do get all that, and then you get all the silly character introductions, like yeah. I am so and so because I'm going to be in every episode from now on, right, right, and, or whatever. But 
anyway, but I do enjoy the show. It's it's wonderfully distracting <laughs> after a day of work. But uh, the, the music, I can't even hear half of it. But I can tell it is it's dense, it's thick, and there's a lot there's a lot happening. There's a lot going on. There's a lot of attention paid to orchestration, and and I appreciate it, mm-hmm. Mr. Kiner. So keep up the good work. Kevin, what have you been watching? Listening? Well, like you, I, I after our interview with John Ottman, I saw X Men within the next couple of days as well. Uh, I really liked it. You know, he mentioned in our interview the little tag that he ended, uh, that he attached to the end of the 20th Century Fox. Yeah, did you catch that? Which I, I noticed. Yeah, and I actually said something to him on Facebook, and he said that he was he was glad that that I noticed it. It was kind of cool. I, I could see how, um, I mean, it, it fit well, but it was also a big departure. And so I can see how you know he had mentioned the first time he had tried that, the executives at at Fox basically told him to get rid of it. I, I could kind of see why they would say that, but it's cool. You <laughs> Do know. you always notice in the X Men movies how the X in the word Fox glows as the screen fades? It does it in every. You know, I don't think I noticed that. No. And, well, see, what got me excited was I heard his his addition or alteration, mm-hmm. and then sure enough, the X. Just stays lit, just a tiny. It's just very a little cool. longer, but it's definitely there in the first X Men, X Two. Yeah, and I I really don't remember X Three. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm and I can't honestly. I don't know about First Class, but it was there on Days of Future Past, and it made me kind of giddy like a schoolboy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so it was cool. Yeah, what the other else? I saw uh, this was probably two or three weeks ago. Was um, I was a little late to this party, but The Amazing Spider Man Two. Okay. With, um, the score by Hans Zimmer and what he calls the Magnificent Six. Because <laughs> um, he couldn't find one more drummer to make it the Magnificent Seven. Right. Right. Um, did you find the score magnificent? I did not. Uh, I mean, I we we've had probably more of our fair share of episodes of us saying bad things about Hans Zimmer. Um, and I don't really feel like taking a whole lot of time to do that right now, but yeah, I this score bothered me a lot. The the movie bothered me a lot. The movie I did not find to be very good at all, but the score kind of drove me crazy. Um, primarily for for a couple of reasons. We we you had talked about this score I think on our last show, and you'd mentioned the um, Jamie Foxx's character Electro. Starts yeah. off as like this, you know, nerdy IT guy with a bad haircut and glasses yeah. and pocket protector yeah. and all that kind of stuff. The bumbling uh, techie yeah. guy, no one, everyone ignores. Right. He he's basically Jim Carrey at the beginning of Batman Forever. Is, yeah. Then the yeah. same thing happens to him more or less. Right. Um. But yeah, and you had mentioned in the the score, his character starts out with this, um this tune in the clarinet, which then as he turns into electro becomes this highly produced, highly processed electronic kind of thing. And I understand that programmatic change. I think that makes sense. You know, if you have this character that turns into this electric bad guy, yeah, a lot of heavily processed electronic stuff that makes sense. Um, I think it's really on the nose, but you know, I find that I don't know. I think sometimes in film music, being really on the nose sometimes has its place. It just strikes um, me as a little ham-fisted is all. I, I think in this case, it really is. I think there are other times when something that's really on the nose works well. And, and the, the classic example that I always go back to for that is the shark theme for Jaws. Every single time the shark is there, you hear that little two-note shark theme. And whenever the shark isn't there, you don't hear it. And, and so the counter example is the part in the movie when the little kids are, they have like the fake shark fin on their back and they're swimming through the little bay or whatever. Everyone starts freaking out. But that's the only time in the movie you see the shark fin and you don't hear the music because the shark's actually not there. So there it, it is. It's really on the nose. Everything is very literal. Um, when the shark is there, the music is, is there. Except the one exception to that is towards the end of the movie when the shark pops up at the back of the boat. And that's the part in the movie when everyone jumps out of their seat. So I think sometimes in a case like that, for the music to really be literal and really be on the nose works. I think in this case, it was, it was just too much. And it's like, okay, we get it. You know, Hans Zimmer doesn't write woodwinds in any of his scores. So when he's going to use it, 
he's going to use it to just confirm that whole Michael Bay, Jerry Bruckheimer feeling of woodwinds are wimpy and brass is muscly, which I think, again, is too, it's too on the nose. It's way too constricting. But just the, the nature of this little clarinet solo, it's just like, it sound, to me, it sounded like really bad Mozart. It's just this tiny cut and paste melody that is super, super boring and super, super predictable. Um, so that kind of drove me nuts. The other thing that drove me nuts about the score is, uh, you know, this whole Magnificent Six idea. He's the people that Hans Zimmer was collaborating with are, I think you could put in the producer songwriter category yeah. more so than the film composer category. And I think that really comes across in the way that music is treated in the film. It's a lot of it isn't, I mean, yeah, there are big action scenes and stuff where there's a lot of loud underscore, but most of the time when you're hearing music in the film, it's almost in a, now here's a pop tune music video kind of way, which I found really disrupting. It's, there's a lot of stuff going on in that movie. It's, it's a lot like Spider-Man three, where there are just too many bad guys and too many, plot threads and stuff going on. But then on top of it, you have all of these, um, almost these musical timeouts where Peter Parker is sad and alone and, you know, walking down a street or in his room or whatever. And you just have this kind of pop tune music that really isn't driving the scene. It's just kind of making you wait. And it almost reminded me of like an aria in an opera. One of the big differences between a recitative and an aria is that arias are generally timeouts, right? Arias stop the plot so that a character can sing about how they feel or whatever. Arias aren't there to move the plot along. And that's what I felt was happening in this film a lot, that whenever we had one of these kind of pop tune cues, it was sort of a dramatic timeout in the story and it was a story that already had too much stuff to get through anyway. So to kind of take all these timeouts in the middle of it just made it worse. So I, I felt that as just from the score, the dramatic standpoint of the score, it didn't really do a good job of serving the film at all. So <laughs> Motion detectors. I know. My lights went out. <laughs> <laughs> that was perfect to come in right at the end of your final word on the score to Amazing Spider-Man 2. Yeah, that's right. I, I think just to add a little commentary to it, and I'm, I'm not saying this to, to, to totally join up with you and jump on them, but it does feel like the, you know, the musical ideas, like if you take the, the clarinet idea or even the trumpet idea that's, that sounds sort of like a guitar idea but just reorchestrated for trumpet, mm-hmm. um, it does kind of feel like that's like a quick first draft of an idea. Yeah, and that Hans Zimmer takes on so many projects now that he has no time to give a second draft. That he has no time to to rethink something and say, "Well, you know, this first idea I had was okay, but I can do better." It doesn't feel like that. It feels like that first draft idea is real simple and almost paper thin, and we're just going to go with that. But right. I'll rely on the orchestrators and my, you know, my amazing studio yeah. to kind of dress it up. But actually, he's he is by far not the only Hollywood composer guilty of that. In fact, I'd say all of them are guilty of that. But, but well, I mean, that's like, kind of the famous Hollywood music or the Hollywood tagline: "Do you want it right or do you want it tomorrow?" I mean, that's just uh, how it works. Yeah. Right. I right. I find myself a little skeptical of this whole um, collaborating with a team of composers to score something, and it kind of reminds me. This is about a year or two ago. We we interviewed Reinhold Heil about Cloud Atlas. Uh-huh. And and he had mentioned working with two other composers on that film, and there would be cues when they would they would say, "Okay, here's the tempo, here's the key, let's all go and do our own thing." Which to me was a little bit of a red flag because if you're saying, "Okay, here's the tempo and here's the key," and then everyone is working separately, that that seems to me to kind of immediately eliminate the idea of structure or chord changes because. I can't do a certain chord progression if I don't know what chord progression you're doing. And I think, I feel like that is sort of an easy way of just ending up with a cue that is just sort of tonic pedal all the way through, because how can you do something like that when, when the work that other people are doing 
has to also be able to fit with what you've done. Um, and I feel like that was probably a lot of what was going on with this score is when you, you've got six people working on music at the same time, I feel like that, that limits some of the types of musical decisions you can make. You know, if it's one person composing, they can make a sharp turn or, or a dramatic twist or something. But if you're working with a whole team of people, each, each contributing to the same cues, or maybe they each contributed to different cues. I don't know. I just, I'm, I'm curious about how the mechanics of all that works. And I think here it didn't work so well. I think what he probably did was similar to the man of steel where he just kind of had a lot of instrumental involvement over kind of like a mapping out where he kind of yeah. probably already knew. So what was going to happen? Group, group improvisation so, kind of stuff. Yeah. So it pro- and, and of course, Thomas Newman has been doing that a lot. Um, yeah. Let's see, I'm trying to think of anybody else really famous. John Williams doesn't. Jerry Goldsmith did not. Danny Elfman does not. James Horner does not uh, in general. But anyway, uh, I think, yeah, I think the guitar and all that was sort of like the the sort of last last minute, not last minute rather, but last element icing on the cake. And I think when you mentioned you can't do a lot of chord changes if you don't know what the other person's doing, and therefore you'd, you have, to do, you'd have to do like a drone or you'd yeah. have to keep it. But I actually think that's what they're doing a lot. They're having very simple, like one to five kind of chord progressions, and that's it. And then they throw in a four. And it was definitely, that was, you know, the Dark Knight scores were really guilty of that as well. So um, anyway, I just hope that Hans Zimmer gets a nice long vacation and doesn't do a comic book movie for a while. And that, you know, if he takes a break between now and Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice, you know, then until, you know, 2016 when that comes out, then I guess that's fine. But anyway, so the ideas can have maybe a, a little more to them, but they are kind of simplistic um, yeah. in any way. So, all right, uh, let's see, what else? Oh, oh, so any other movies, any other TV shows you want to talk about? No, I, I think those were the two big ones for me. Okay, uh, there's been some cool CDs coming out. Um, well, we already mentioned How to Train Your Dragon, so I'll give a disclaimer. It's technically not out yet, but do pay attention for around the 17th of June. That's when it's scheduled for release. But Probably there have been next Tuesday, I would imagine that that's what that is, right? Uh, let's see. So 12 oh, plus, yeah. yeah, yeah. So that'd be next Tuesday. Yep. And then uh, now you mentioned having film composers write classical music, and I just recently purchased one, but I am guilty of not having had a chance to listen to it yet. And special props go out to uh, Scott Glasgow for pointing me to this. But uh, this is The Stonecutters, a string quartet by Elliot Goldenthal. Really? Yep. That and, sounds cool. Yeah, and I'm looking forward to checking it out. It's also got his uh, brass quartet number two, three, piece, uh, three pieces for piano, and sonata for double bass and piano. So it's kind of like the Elliot Goldenthal classical album that you didn't know you wanted, but secretly kind of did. But now I want it. Right, right, and he did write um, Grendel, which was kind of like a Beowulf opera retelling from the yeah. point of view of the villain. And I don't know yet if that's been released, but I've heard amazing things about people that had a chance to to check out the opera. So, anyway, so Grent, not Grendel, rather, but the Stonecutters is out now. You can order it through Amazon. Uh, let's see what else. Uh, Night Crossing and Deep Rising are two scores by Goldsmith that have recently received a remaster re- and an expanded treatment. They're both now available. The Peacemaker uh, has a two CD version, and I don't know if anyone, any of our listening audience, is old enough to remember. That was, I remember that one. That was uh, with George Clooney and Nicole Kidman, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. An action movie. And you don't see Clooney really do anything anything like that anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, Hans Zimmer scored it. That was like right, I remember right when like Spielberg and Geffen and all those guys got together for DreamWorks and they created the company. Mm-hmm. That was, I remember that kind of being like one of their first big, big produced movies. Anyway, so that's out and it's a two CD treatment. Altered States. Speaking of another classical composer, John Corleano, that's one of who, his most. Who was the teacher of Ellie Goldenthal? Who uh, yeah, just a moment ago. Yeah, exactly. And so there has been a new kind of treatment of Alter States. I I believe it to be more of a remastering than an, an expansion. Okay. Uh, and Daryl, if anyone, and of course, this is going even further back into the '80s, but um, that uh, with the score by Marvin Hamlish is now available. And then uh, recently, to bring it back up to modern day. The DC most recent DC animated movie, Son of Batman, 
with a score by Friedrich Wiedemann, uh, is now available as well. So those are some cool new things coming out, um, and check those out if you can. I've got a few of them ordered, so I haven't listened to any really any of them yet. Um, or I did see the uh, the bat the son of Batman, mm-hmm. and it was uh, that was pretty cool. Uh, let's see what else we got. Uh, oh, so Kevin, yeah. So for our for our, listen, for our listeners, check this out. So Kevin recently went to Los Angeles yes. because he's like a secret agent. I don't know. Can you talk about why you went there? Or sure, I I, I basically went there um, on a research trip. Um, I had uh, a couple of composition lessons with a few different composers, uh, some of whom I, I met actually while doing this podcast. So um, some some friends of the show, which was very cool. Um, and I did some touristy things and saw family, but a lot of it, it was, I was kind of lunch meetings and lessons and stuff like that, which was a lot of fun. I, I, uh, I had a lesson with Bruce Broughton, who was our very, very first guest in this podcast, who was great. Uh, it was really cool. Cause I walked in, into his studio and just on the shelf, right, right in, inside the door were like his 10 Emmys and they were enormous and like glowing and gold and stuff. It was very cool. <laughs> Uh, and then I, there was I, a choir singing when you, yeah, yeah. It just, it was, it had an you know, motion sensor. So you walk in and that, that track starts up. It was cool. Um, I had a, a, a nice chat with Conrad Pope, who we talked with a few months ago. Also a very nice guy. Um, yeah. I had, um, I met with, uh, a guy I've known for a couple of years, John Dixon, who, um, has done a lot of work in TV. He wrote music for the series burn notice for many years. Um, there was a show a couple years ago called The Good Guys with Colin Hanks and Bradley Whitford. He did music for that one as well. And I think it only lasted one season. Um, totally underrated and an awesomely funny show, by the way. I thought it was pretty funny, yeah. So, and it so should have yeah, it it it, survived. Yeah, so it was kind of talking shop with a lot of those people. Um, and it's some interesting conversations about uh, sort of their thoughts on, on the status of film music right now and things like that. Uh, I also took a, a lovely guided tour of the Joanne Kane Music Service, which was an awesome place to go to. Um, so thanks to uh, Eric Swanson, who kind of showed me around that place. Um, so yeah, that was that was my trip. It was, it was great. Did you get to look at any music while you were at Joanne Kane? I did a little bit. There was I was sort of peeking at some stuff that was lying about. Um, they had uh, on one of their tables just a, a stack of. Um, scores from John Powell's uh, How to Train Your Dragon 2, which were sitting there from having been recorded a couple of weeks ago. Um, They had some just loose, handwritten, very interesting handwritten score pages of uh, some of Alan Silvestri's music for the first episode of Cosmos, which was orchestrated by William Ross, who a very famous orchestra out in L.A. He's been music director for the Oscars the last couple of years. Um, I just thought it was fascinating that he, you know, here is this music that was only a couple of months old, but I was looking at a, you know, a handwritten full page of orchestration, which is not something you see terribly often. So, uh, and then, but their, their archives, they also house um, the archives for 20th Century Fox. So, you walk around and you see a big box with the score and parts from Star Wars, which is now like my Facebook photo that I had to take a picture of. Um, but, you know, Jerry Goldsmith, um, <clears throat> Alien, that score was sitting there. Um, all the John Williams stuff, you know, Star Wars Episode Three or Minority Report. So it was cool to just kind of walk through their archives and see the types of things that they, they have in storage there. But it was also really neat to, to see what they do and – and all that kind of thing and talk about kind of their work process and all that kind of stuff. It was really neat. Cool. Yeah. And then you had a picture with the Batmobile, which I'm also jealous oh, of. Oh, that's right. Yeah. I, I was at um, the Warner Brothers studio and one of the things on their tour is they have a sound stage. They call it the Batcave. It's just a sound stage with like a couple of black lights. But they have all of the um, the movie Batman vehicles. Uh, they have all the Batmobile Plus, I think like a boat from Batman and Robin or Batman Forever or something, and they have the the Bat Pod from The Dark Knight. The only Batmobile they didn't have, they, they I don't think they had the Adam West Batmobile. They didn't have, uh, and I think this was by choice. They didn't have the George Clooney Batman and Robin Batmobile. That, that's the is it the the Adam West one? Is that the ugly orange one? 
that's the black and orange one yeah yeah um but the, the yeah the george clooney one from batman and robin they did not have and i it's probably in part because they don't want you to remember that that movie happened um but the cool thing about these batmobiles that they had was that these were not reproductions or anything like that these were the picture cars these were the cars that they used in the movies which was neat and so i yeah i took my picture in front of the uh the Tim Burton, Michael Keaton Batmobile, and sent it to Bill to make him jealous. So, okay, mission yeah. accomplished. Yeah, <laughs> I thought that would work. All right, and so you're yeah. all back. Sure. In, uh, you're back in Florida now. You're all done I, with that. I'm back in Florida now. Yes. Okay. All right. Um, okay. Well, uh, so we were thinking about what's going on for the rest of the summer, and we realized we're about halfway through. So yeah. uh, ha the summer season, if you look at it from one angle, it seems to most of like the big tentpole comic book movies have kind of all played out. But there are still some few things we're looking forward to seeing in the rest of them. And we just thought we'd give kind of a sh quick shout-out mm -hmm. to some other things. Um, so uh, let's see. I was kind of thinking, hey, uh, Guardians of the Galaxy had a couple really great trailers, and I'm really excited. And that kind of goes for the whole thing. I want to, you know, see what Tyler Bates is going to do for a score and to see the movie in general and enjoy it. Um, Kevin, you got uh, one or two you're thinking of. Yeah, I, you know, the uh, I think it's next month. Um, Dawn of the Planet of the Apes comes out. Now, the first movie was scored by Patrick Doyle. This one round will be is or has been scored by Michael Giacchino. I'm pretty sure they're done recording all that stuff already. Um, so I, I'm looking forward to that, you know. Michael Giacchino's scores, you know, his Pixar scores are, are usually pretty great. Some of his other scores maybe not quite as good, but I'm, I'm still always looking forward to what he's doing. I'm looking forward to that one. I'm pretty excited about what he's going to do for Jurassic Park, which comes out, uh, according to, there was a thing on Twitter today, it comes out a year from today. So, Oh, Jurassic World? Jurassic World, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. And then um, the one that comes out in a couple of months, it's called Kingsman, The Secret Service. This was... Um, this was the movie that Matthew Vaughn, who directed X-Men First Class, um, there's a speculation that he, because he was supposed to direct Days of Future Past, and the speculation, or maybe this is confirmed, I don't know, is that he left Days of Future Past so that he could go and direct this, this movie, which I saw a trailer for in front of X-Men or Spider-Man or one of those movies. Um, so this is music by Henry Jackman, who he worked with on, on First Class, and Matthew Margeson. Um, it it's kind of looks like it's not exactly a James Bond movie, but kind of an, an, an almost a combination of um, uh, what was that movie that came out a couple years ago with Angelina Jolie and Salt. the guy from X Men who plays the young Professor X? What's that guy's name? Oh, um, Wanted. Yeah, yeah. It almost looks like it's a combination of Wanted and James Bond because it's, it's you know, this kind of Secret Service spy thing, but it's also this underground organization thing, kind of like Wanted. So I don't know. I think it looks pretty cool. And Henry Jackman's been doing a lot of cool stuff lately, so I'm kind of excited about it. Okay. So no love for Expendables 3 then? No. And, you know, the one <laughs> I'm, I'm really – I'm going to have to work hard to avoid because I treasure my childhood. It's Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. I have I have no desire to see it or hear the score or anything. <laughs> well, I'm going to avoid that one. Of... It's hard. What's that, Dave? Dave, did you? Dave didn't oh. say anything. Oh, okay. Uh, so speaking of childhood, uh, Transformers Four, I think, is now the number. The Age of Extinction. That's yeah. going to come out and. I, I sort of have a, um, a a slightly evolving outlook on the Transformers movie. What began with curiosity and quickly turned into disinterest <laughs> and apathy, and then in the in the next couple of years, sort of angled slightly back up to realize they're only going to be what they're going to be, and the um, the amusement and enjoyment of seeing a movie on the IMAX screen seems to be tailor made to be pummeled or at least have your senses pummeled. By yeah. seeing a Transformers movies in that environment, so I just hope Steve Jablonski, who's set up to do part four, mm -hmm. gives us something great to listen to. Although I'm sure it will be covered up by um, everything else in that movie. <laughs> you could you could have stopped that sentence early. It'll be covered up by everything. <laughs> just by everything. you are going to get everything all the time. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, uh, there's that and. 
Yeah, I don't really. I mean, the the Planet of the Apes. Uh, you know, that's that's cool. I'm looking forward to the movie and the score. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so that's about it. Anything else? No, I think that's about it for me. I, I find it it's interesting that movie wise, yeah, you're right. It feels like we are, are about halfway through summer, and that a lot of the big summer movie releases have already happened. Even though technically it's not summer yet, we still have like a week and change to go before it's actually summertime. Yeah, and I movie think, wise, yeah, it seems like we are we're on the back end almost. Yeah, and there's also the the Hercules movie with The Rock, which who knows? The Rock is pretty fun, and the movie could be entertaining, and it's a larger than life character, which could you know bring along with it a larger than normal movie score. But yeah, in, anyway, uh, we'll see, <laughs> we'll see how that goes. Um, anyway. Yes, so that will do it for this episode of Streamers and Punches. You can listen to us on soundnotion.tv slash SAP, where you can subscribe to our show, leave comments, uh, and find links to the music we spoke about. You can also subscribe to the show through iTunes. My name is Bill Witham. And I'm Kevin Wilt. And thank you for listening.